My name is Michael Smith. I am 34 years old. My original diagnosis was depression along with anxiety. When I was diagnosed with schizophrenia, I was actually about 20 years old. Schizophrenia for me is not about seeing things that aren't there, but rather hearing things that are not there. Imagine there's 10 people behind you, and they're all talking at the same time, and it's just this chatter of noise and voices that uh, kind of never ceases. The voices that I have uh, are very negative, telling me bad things about myself. Uh, you're worthless, no one cares about you, it would be better off if you were gone or dead. Schizophrenia, people think psycho. It's really just the same as any other mental illness. It's a chemical malfunction in the brain. Just because you have schizophrenia, it doesn't make you a psychotic killer. My name is Cheryl Smith. I'm Mike Smith's mother. When Mike first became ill, it was very difficult to understand what was going on with him. It took a lot of education and a lot of experience. I was in denial for a very long period of time because I didn't want him to have a mental illness. I didn't want him to be hurting in any way. At first, I tried to self-medicate using drugs and alcohol. I had friends along the way who would say, you know, Mike, you need to slow down, you're out of control. I would tell them that they didn't know how to party. But when things really got rough and I really needed help, these people weren't there for me. I didn't know about the partying and drug use when he was in high school. And when it came to light, I was really shocked and thought, how could I be so oblivious to it? The self-medicating is a temporary answer for a long-term problem. Bad days for me usually begin with an increased volume of the voices that I hear. It's hard to get moving, hard to stay out of bed. Sometimes it's hard even to eat. You don't have much of an appetite. And I get scared. I get really scared of what I might do to myself. I could tell that Michael was not well. and We were standing outside on the street. And so I called up my wife and I said, I don't think that Michael is well. Should I be doing something? And she said to me, did you ask him if he felt like killing himself? And I said, absolutely not. I'm not going to ask him if because I would feel that that would be a bad thing to do. I'm not going to plant ideas inside his head that he might do something bad. And she said, no, no, you, that's what you're supposed to do. And so I, I asked him, I said, do you feel like killing yourself, Michael? And he said, yes. And I was surprised at his answer because I didn't think he'd be honest with me. She could hear him in the background when I was on the cell phone. She said, ask him, uh, does he have a plan? And I said, Michael, do you have a plan? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, when are you going to put your plan into effect, Michael? And he said, well, as soon as we get finished talking here. And we, we didn't get finished talking because I knew right away that I had to call up 911 and get some help from right away and I knew I needed to stay with him. I couldn't leave him alone under those circumstances. My mother and my father have always been there for me. I've been in and out of hospitals for a long time. Those days when I think, you know, no one cares, no one cares, and then they walk in the door. It's just a reminder that there's someone out there who really does care. I feel very lucky to have them in my life as supports. For parents, I would say that First of all, you need to become aware of what the signs might be of impending mental illness or developing mental illness. Knowledge is power, and people need to be empowered to see what can be accomplished. He works hard in this process of recovery, but it's not recovery like we know and understand it. Have you recovered from the flu? Yep. Yep, I'm all better now. Have you recovered from mental illness? Well, the correct answer would be for him. I'm in the process. It's a process of recovery. You don't get over it. You live with it, and then you do something with your life with it. And that's what he's doing, and, and I'm very proud of him because I can see that it's not easy. I have been sober for five years, and it has been a, a struggle. I tried a lot of AA meetings, the Alcoholics Anonymous, and NA, Narcotics Anonymous. Didn't really work for me. But the thing that changed was my perspective. I finally said, you know what, I'm frustrated with this. I don't need this in my life. This is not helping me to go where I wanna go. And I've had enough. I've been able to stick to that, fortunately. I like to think of my life and my routines as coping skills. I liken it to a plumber who has a toolbox. He doesn't come with one wrench and say, okay, this is gonna fix everything. I think there's a lot of things that are incorporated in recovery. Medication is very huge. That was a lesson that took me a little while to learn that I had to stick to it and uh, not skip here or skip there or say, I don't need this anymore. Hobbies, writing, 
reading, playing my guitar, also spending time with my dog. She's a big part of my life. We like to go hiking and walking a lot. I also see a psychiatrist every month. We see a therapist once a week. These things have become my toolbox. The healing comes in places where I don't expect it to. My father runs this big vegetable garden. I used to hate going out there. Just over the past maybe year, it's kind of a self-soothing place to go. It's some kind of like uh, meditation, being out there and working and being in tune with nature. I'm very proud of Mike because he has made a very good life out of a very bad situation. He's making the best of that struggle in reaching out to others so that others can understand about mental illness. My biggest achievement was getting involved in the Ending the Silence program through NAMI. NAMI stands for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. That's the nation's largest grassroots organization supporting and educating and advocating for people who are mentally ill and their family members. I go into high schools, sometimes middle schools, we've even done the juvenile detention center, and I give presentations about my experiences with mental illness. It gives me a sense of value. It gives me a sense of purpose and meaning. You know, there's a lot of stigma that follows mental health. Slowly, I'm seeing changes. Some very famous people have come out and said they struggle with mental illness. And people are like, wow, I, I never would have imagined that. I mean, these people excelled in life, excelled in what they do, and they had a mental illness that they struggled with, and they're not afraid to say it, and neither am I. My advice would be to seek professional help, and the sooner the better. And I know it can be difficult. I'm not saying it's an easy road to take. Another thing that I think is very important is honesty with these people who are trying to help you. If you can't be honest with them, they don't know how to truly help you. I remember one time I went to see my psychiatrist. You know, I walk in and she says, how are you? I'm like, oh, I'm doing okay. A few hours later, I was making an attempt on my life. That was the point when I realized the power of honesty with these people who are trying to help you. You know, people are not just a diagnosis. You're not just someone with schizophrenia or someone with depression or anxiety. You are a whole person. There is hope, there is a future. Sometimes we go day by day just trying to make it through. But there's a quote, a friend gave me a note and all it said on the note was, you were given this life because you were strong enough to live it. I think that's a brilliant um, way to look at things.